Hi there, Sugar Snaps. Welcome back to my studio. If you're new here, welcome in. My name is Brittany. I'm glad to have you. I am the creator behind the channel, Textile Indie, and here we do basket weaving, natural dyeing, dyeing, spinning, and lots of other fiber arts and fun projects. So welcome in. Today I want to do a basket for a like a planter basket. So I don't have a really clear plan for this project yet. So you're kind of going to go along with me in the design to creation process. So I have this macrame planter hanger thing that the basket will sit inside and I'll show you an example. So I want to do something kind of like this, not exactly, this is a bean pot and I don't want to handle on the planter basket, uh, but you open this up, it's just like kind of working with a rope ladder. <laughs> open this up and you set it in there so then it hangs like that. You've probably seen these online places. So I want to do a basket that's a little bit smaller than this um, with a twined base, I think. So like this basket, do a twined base bottom, spokes for the sides, and then do a rim with a half inch half oval reed and then lash it around the top. So I'm going to, I guess, use this as kind of an example of what I'm going for. And I'll get out my little sketchbook here. I want to do a round basket, so I'm gonna create that round opening. And I want the sides to be more straight than the bean pot was, and then have a round, kind of a rounded base. So it goes around like that. Then it will have a rim that's lashed, like so around there and then the stakes will go in this direction kind of around the basket and then we'll have some weaving over top like so like that okay so then the base we'll do the base will be spokes going in different directions like this and then it will be twined in the round like that so the size that i want to go for i'm going to base off of this Hanger. Ah, this is hard to lay out flat. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is get to that bottom knot that sits at the bottom of the planter and lay out the spokes because I want to estimate how far out I want the bottom to be. And I'll take my measuring tape. I think I want to go with eight inches. So do an eight inch bottom. Okay, so we're gonna start out by cutting 10 stakes at 30 inches, and I'm going to use this 3 8 inch wide flat reed. So I'm gonna open the bundle up, pull out a piece. I like to pull from the bundle when it's flat on old surface so that I can maintain the nice bundle formation. Pull out two pieces here. Okay, and then I'm gonna line up the measuring tape with the end of the reed and measure out 30 inches. And use my reed cutters to cut at 30 inches. So I'm going to cut out 10 of these and each stake will go into the water. Oops. Go into the water as soon as I've cut it so that it can start to soak a bit. Get those all in your water bucket so that they can soak up the water. When you're weaving baskets, you want your reed to remain damp so that it's nice and pliable. So this is rattan reed, comes from a vine in Indonesia. They process it and make it into different sizes, widths, and types. So this is a flat reed. It also comes in round reed, which is just round. Um, and then it comes in half oval, so where it's flat, or not half oval, flat oval, where it's flat on one side and then kind of rounded or ovaled on the other side. And I'm done with this reed, so I'm tying it up so that it doesn't go everywhere. It's easier to store this way. So once it's tied, I can store it in a bin on its side so that I can see the width and be able to pull it out nice and easily. I'll put a list in the description below of all the materials and tools I'm using. 
uh, since I'm designing this as I go, I'm not gonna go over the materials first because I don't know what I'm going to use yet. So I'll uh, put everything down there. So check that out for a full list of what comes of this project. I'm gonna start with the round read because I do wanna do a twined base. Then pull out a piece of round read. Round read is one of the more challenging reads to keep from tangling and un pull out a piece from the bundle just because it's so small and brittle and it tangles so easily. So I just kind of thread it through as best I can, guiding it through uh, one piece at a time. If you know a better way to do this or you have an idea of a better way to do this, please leave a comment below because this is not my favorite part of basket weaving. There's a piece. So pull out probably three to four lengths of the round reed if they're pretty decent lengths. Like that's kind of a short piece, but we'll go with it. And this we will be using to create the base of the basket or twine the base, which is a um, basic basket weaving technique to create a round base that's not a solid wooden base. It's formed with reed, like the bean pot I showed you earlier. Now I have some pieces of round reed ready to go and I'm going to switch places, put the round reed into the water bin and take the 3 8 inch flat reed stakes out. And the reed doesn't need to soak for very long, usually only like 30 seconds. Um, so I'm gonna work away at the base while those soak, but they don't really have to be in there any specific amount of time. You can just dunk them and tap them off on your work surface if you need to as well. Okay, so I have a lot of stakes here. Um, I went with 10 and we're going to divide these into half. So bring out five pieces of the uh, stake reed and we're going to start out with five spokes. And you know what? We need to mark the centers. So let's mark the center points of these. So that would be at 15 inches, you're going to mark that point on the stake with your pencil. And I like to do this because then we know where the center point is and we don't have to guess when we're laying out the spokes. And the other reason I do this is that it allows me, it gives me a chance to feel the texture of the reed and choose the right and the wrong side because rattan reed has a smoother side, which is the right side, and a rougher side, which is the wrong side. You want the smoother side to end up on the outside of the basket because it looks nice, has a nice sheen to it, and it will have less hairs and little, uh, less texture to make the basket look fuzzy from the outside. So we'll put the fuzzy kind of hairy side on the inside. And by hairs, I mean little fibers that are sticking up off of the reed. So I'll lay my measuring tape out here, mark 15 inches and I'm going to go over each one of these and do that. So you can follow along, feel the texture on each side. Sometimes it's hard to tell, like this one, there's hairs on both sides. So if it's a little more challenging and both sides seem very similar, just choose the side that's less textured, less um, or more smooth. Okay, that's those, and then we'll do the other five. Okay, the center of our stakes are marked, so now we're going to take those with the marks facing up or wrong side facing up and layer them on top of each other so that that center mark matches up. We're placing those right on top of each other. Create an X, and then across that X, we'll put two more of the stakes piling them so that there's kind of even spacing. And now because we're using an odd number, we'll pile that on kind of haphazardly or just choose a space and then go in and gently adjust so that you have approximately the same amount of space between each stake. And then you can take a spoke weight or a hammer, something heavy to place over the stakes to hold them in place. It acts as a third hand, so you can have your hands free to do something else. And in this case, we're going to start the twining. So grab one of your pieces of round reed from your water bin. See, and already somehow I've managed to get this all tangled up. 
Okay, that's a bit of a mess. Now we're going to take these and offset the ends so that one's a little bit longer than the other, about a foot longer, and then draw this through your hand and you're going to crimp the end gently because this stuff is brittle. Just slowly fold it in half. You want to fold the reed in half so that we have a loop that we can loop over the reed. And I'm just moving really slowly because I don't want to break this. And I got a little bit of a crack, but that's okay. Just kind of stretched out. Okay, so there's my fold. Now we're going to loop this over one of the stakes, preferably one of the stakes that's piled underneath this first stake. Situate your loop over one of the stakes and then kind of tuck it in close to that center point where the stakes meet in the middle. And now the reason we have offset these pieces, I'll kind of show you that coming up, but uh, it's so that they end at different points so that we don't have to splice in new reed at the same point. It strengthens the basket if you're only splicing or adding a new piece of reed for one length at a time. Twining is basically crisscrossing the reed around a stake. So you're going to take the top piece or the piece that's floating on top of that first stake, take it and loop it around and underneath the next stake, pull them close together so that they create an X between the two stakes. So they're crisscrossing like this between the two stakes. Now again, the piece that floats on top goes underneath the next piece and you're going to pull it down, tuck it in close to that those stakes. And there's going to be a bit of a space here because you do need space for that X to fit. And so we're not going to press it all the way into the very center point. There will be a little bit of room, but uh, just tuck in as close as you can. So then the piece that's underneath what it is doing is floating over top of the next stake. So it goes underneath the stake and over the next stake. And this piece that's going over this stake goes under this next stake. So for this first row, I'm going to work around the base without moving anything other than the twining reed, which is the round reed we're working with. I'm going to keep these stakes flat on the table. After this first row, everything will be held together, so we'll be able to shift it around and um, not have to contort our bodies uh, so much. This first row, you need to kind of establish that shape first to hold everything together. So we're going to be awkwardly weaving the space until everything's held together. So again, top piece goes underneath the next, or the following stake. And we basically are just working with whatever reed piece ends up on top because the piece that's underneath just kind of floats over to the top of the next reed or next stake and does what it needs to do automatically. So again, top piece goes up and around unless, <laughs> problem solving here, unless as you're grabbing, it accidentally pulls both reeds underneath and then it's not doing what you want it to do. In that case, what you are looking at is bring both pieces back on top so that they're floating on top of the stakes so that you can orient yourself. And then see the, find the piece that's floating underneath the previous stake. That's the state, or that's the piece of the twining that you want to float on top of the next stake. And then the piece that's floating on top on the previous stake, bring that around and weave it underneath the next stake. So again, we're going to continue that around until we meet where we started. And you can see I'm creating kind of a wagon wheel effect or, I don't know, a wheel. A lot of my language is, uh, or the words that I use, come from American literature from the old days, like pioneer times. And I've discovered that I use a lot of words that most people are like, what is that? Like the other day in a game, I used the word parchment instead of paper, because in my mind, what I was looking at looked more like parchment. And everybody else was like, what is parchment? And how is it different? I thought that was just paper. I was like, um, oh, okay. <laughs> so when I say wagon wheel, that's where that's coming from. There's probably a more modern term to describe what I'm looking at, but in my brain, it just looks like a wagon wheel to me. 
Okay, so now we're kind of back to where we started. We have one steak left. So I'm going to lift up my spoke weight, move this aside out of my way. We're probably done with it for this process. The spoke weight is really beneficial when you're doing the base. After you're done with the base, it's kind of unnecessary because you're not doing anything flat. Once you build the walls, everything's 3D, so it's not super helpful. Although I have used it to help me create this uh, straight sides on a basket. If you wanna watch this video, I created a tray, a basket tray, and I used the steak weights clamp to the sides to dry the sides nice and straight so that they didn't bow out, and it worked like a charm. There's a coffee shop down the road from my house, and they do lavender cardamom lattes, which are delicious. Cardamom is a spice, I don't actually know what it comes from, which would be an interesting thing to look up but it's a spice and combined with the lavender, which has a florally taste because it's a flower. Yeah, it's just a really good tasty combination with the coffee and the milk of the latte. Mm, so good. Okay, back to weaving our basket. Around this last steak, and now we're back to where we started. And we're gonna continue doing what we've been doing. So continue to bring that top piece of reed, ah, words, man, top piece of reed around. And here at this point, we need to tuck in this starting loop in a bit so that we end up with a nice circle because right at this point, we're eyeballing the circle and this is the shape. We're establishing the shape that the base of our basket will then end up. So if your shape is off like that, the base of your basket is gonna have this kind of a shape to it. So if you want a round basket, you definitely don't have to go for a round basket, but for my planter, I want it to fit nice in the planter hanger thing. So I'm going for a round basket. So I'm going to work on shaping my circle out like this and then pull this starting loop down a little bit so that I can bring this next row right up against it and continue that round shape without having it be off kilter. So then continue twining and now everything's held in place so you can pick up your base and move it around instead of twisting around to weave. You can move the base so that it's easier to weave. And now we're going to do this process, twining process, probably I'm guessing like three to four times around before we put on or add in the other set of the stakes. And the reason, uh, we do that or that we weave some first and then add in the stakes is that we're trying to weave up until the point where there's the space between these stakes is wide enough that when we put a new stake over top there's room in between each stake for this crossover of the the um, twiny so we have to build up enough of the base to create that space. Okay, so that's my, here's my third. And to count it, you're counting, if you look at the stake, you're counting each one of the round reed pieces. So this was our row one, this is our row two, and this is our row three. So we've done three rows around here. Over here, you can see we've only done two because there's only two rows there. So we've started the third row around. And I use my left hand pointer finger to pull things in as I'm weaving, just kind of speeds my weaving up a little bit. So I weave with my right hand, switching those places where the twining is going and then pull in with my left hand and then switch positions of the base. So I bring that around and then pull in with my left hand, lift it up and weave and rotate kind of simultaneously. The more in the groove I am, the more fluid my motions are. Okay, I started my fourth row. I'll go the whole fourth row around and then decide whether I want to include the new stakes or if I need to leave a few more, including the new stakes. So now I'm going to match this up. And I have, you want about a quarter inch of space right up that up against that last row between each of the stakes so that you can fit the twining so 
let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I definitely have that at row five here. I only have four rows on this stake, so it's a little bit tighter in between here. I can probably get away with it. I think I'm gonna go ahead and do the fifth row around and then incorporate the new stakes because then I just have enough room and won't have to be forcing the twining between the stakes. Okay, so back where that loop is right here, that's where I'm going to stop. Now orient that away from me and then Actually, we are going to need the stake weight again because incorporating these will need the stake weight to set on top. So I'm going to tuck this under these ends over top here and you're continuing to, well, actually you're putting each of these new stakes in between the previous stakes. So there should be a stake to go in between each of the previous stakes. So put them, tuck it under your weaving reed, pile it on top, and then it'll go diagonally. So stack that like so. Not this one. Okay, and then I have one more. There we go. Now the stake weight on top here and then I can continue the twining. I am coming to the end of this piece of twining, so I'll show you how to splice in a new piece as we go. So again, just like we were doing before, you're going to twine in between. Ooh, and even with that spacing, it's still a little bit tight, so I'm glad I did that fifth row. So tuck it in as tight as you can up against that last row. It might be hard depending on what size round reed you're using to get in really close. Mine's a little bit thicker, so have to work at getting those in tightly enough. If you hear drilling or kind of a rumbling sound, I apologize. My husband and I are building a table for a uh, for our living or dining room, a big, big uh, farmhouse table, and he's currently working on the legs because we are a few days before Christmas when I'm filming this, and we want to have it done in time to host family and have family over. And it's a 10 foot big farmhouse table. So he's downstairs working on that while I'm doing this. Okay, this is a little bit tricky. If you are struggling to pack things with your fingers, having a straight tip packer or some sort of like a screwdriver, this is basically a, all that the tip is flattened, all. A W L all that the tip is flattened so that you can come in and pack your layers closer together. This is a little bit easier on your hands. So using your tools will help protect your fingers. Basket weaving has a tendency to dry your hands out and I end up with kind of broken cuticles quite often when I'm weaving consistently because the reed sucks the moisture out of your hands somehow and working in the water with the wet, it just ends up drying out my hands. So if you need a nice hand salve, I have a video up here, I put a recipe together on how to create your own hand salve so that you can keep your hands nice and moisturized while you're weaving and the oils won't hurt the reed um, because they're all natural oils that will work well when you're basket weaving. Okay, so now we're to the, basically to the end of this piece, I'm going to snip the piece down so that it meets about a little bit over the center of the stake so that the end just kind of fits over top here. And then take a new piece of twining, a piece a little longer than that. No, okay, this will work. Okay, and then match up the end of this right next to where we just snipped and bring it around the next stake. Just like we were before, the ends are just going to stick up here on the inside of the basket where we splice them together. So then continue to weave, bringing in these new stakes. Oh, we're so close. Okay, so now things are pretty much incorporated into it so I can move it around. Once you've woven a half of the, half of the base, you'll have attached all the stakes 
in place and so they won't move around. Oh no, my reed cracked. Okay, let's see if that... It's not broken in half, so I think that'll be okay. Just has a little crack on it. Okay, continuing around. Okay, so that's all incorporated. Now we're going to continue to twine around this base until it meets the dimension that you want it to be. You want however wide you want the base to be. For me, that was eight inches. Eight inches. So from the center point, that would be four inches on either side if you match up the four at the center stake. So I have almost two inches to go around the base. So I've got a, several more rows to weave. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this weaving. You can follow along. Um, yeah. Let's speed it up a little bit. Oh, real quick note. Whenever you come to the end, again, just snip it off so that it fits over top of a stake. And then you'll fit in a new piece of the twining reed, the round reed, right next to it, right up against it like that. And then continue to weave with that piece just like you would if it hadn't ended, ended hadn't ended. Okay, so let's weave another two inches of the base or however much big, however wide you want the base to be. I've got about an inch left to go, so I'm getting close to finishing the twining around this basket. And I just wanted to let you know, I have a um, website which has several basket weaving courses. So if you want to dive into some more complicated cord or baskets, uh, you can check those out. I have a the bean pot basket that I was showing you earlier and a market basket that has a braided motif. And then I'm currently working on doing a oval ribbed basket or a melon basket. So it's a large 20 by 12 melon basket. So that will be available soon on there as well. You can purchase those on my, or from my website. And I'll put the links in the description below. If you enjoy my work and you want to support me so that I can continue to create content here on YouTube, I would really appreciate that. I have a Patreon. Patreon is a way for creators to be supported by their audience online through monthly small donations uh, in exchange for exclusive content. So if you wanna check that out, I have the link in the description below for that as well. Okay, I'm going to go take a break and work on assembling our dining room table. I'll be back momentarily to finish this basket with you. Okay, I'm back. So I'm going to finish twining the base here and I need to end where I started. So to check where that is, you can flip over to the bottom of the basket and see where that starting loop was, where you began the twining. So I started here, so I need to work this twining all the way to the stake next to where I started. So this is where I started. I'll finish off on the stake next to that. So that's this stake here. I'm going to mark that by adding a clamp to that stake. That's where I'm going to end and then incorporate a new piece of twining because I ended here. Okay, so I'm going to end a little bit early because I'm running out of twining anyways. So I'm going to trim this short piece right on top of that stake and then the next piece, one stake over, trim those there, and then remove this clamp. You can go around and fold the stakes in like I'm going to do. Fold them into the center right at the base of the twining I'm just creating a little crease so that I have a starting point or the stakes are trained to fold up when I start to weave. And be careful as you fold because they can crack. And a twine base, it's a lot harder to add a or replace a stake than it is a um, rectangular base basket because there's so much twining to weave it through. Whereas when you're replacing a stake in a rectangular or square basket, it's there's less rows to fit the new stake through. This one, you'd have to lift up every single one of these round reeds and it, with the center point, it's just complicated. It can be done. So if you do break a stake, 
it'll just weave it back through or pull the original one out and then weave the new one back through where that original stake was. Um, if you can be careful, that avoids that whole problem. Now we're going to start to weave the walls and I'm going to grab some of this uh, the, what is it, flat oval reed. This piece, I think it's a thinner reed. I think I'm going to save this for a rim lashing. I'll set that aside and grab out some of the quarter inch wide flat oval. And I'll throw a bunch into my bucket of water, get it damp. And then we're going to start weeding. So grab a clamp to start out with and I move this to the floor so I don't catch it. Having a nice clean area around you is helpful because as you're weaving, the end of your weaver is kind of going to be flopping everywhere and it can catch on stuff and pull things off the table as you're working. Now I'm going to start incorporating this weaver. So I'm going to work from the outside of the basket now. So laying the weaver on the outside of one of these stakes. And I'm not starting anywhere particular. I'm just adding it to a stake, clamp that in place, and then we're going to weave in an over-under pattern. So starting on the outside or over, now we're going to weave this under the next stake, over this stake, under, rotate the basket so that you can follow along. And I'm adding some tension so that it pulls the stakes upwards and starts to build that first row for the walls. I'm weaving under over each one back to where we began. And then under this one here. Now we're going to, oops, if this happens and your end comes loose, you can just weave it back into where you started and maybe clamp further down the row so that you can do your overlap. So I'm going to grab my scissors and I'm going to overlap four stakes. So I'm going to overlap this in here, tuck that behind so that it's hidden away, overlap behind this one, over this one, and then we're going to cut to the outside of this stake, trim it down, and tuck it behind here like so. Now for this row, I do suggest adding a clamp to hold things in place because it will want to shift around and spring undone. Finished our first row, we're going to rotate the basket all the way to the opposite side and start the next row on the opposite side. We started that last row. So grab another clamp and this time you're going to clamp the reed to a piece where the previous row was an under row. So where the reed goes behind the stake, we're going to attach the reed to the outside of the stake. So then weave under the next one. We're weaving the opposite pattern to what the row we did previous weave around the basket like so. And then when you come to that clamp, you'll just lift the clamp, make sure that the pieces of reed are stacked on top of each other and continue to weave around. Now I'm coming back to the beginning. I'm going to lift this Clamp up, move it down a few stakes so that it's still holding it in place, holding the weaver in place, but I can work over the end, overlapping so that they're nice and tucked in and the ends are hidden away. So I'll cut to the outside of this fourth stake over. Oops, that flung out. And then tuck this end underneath here and clamp that in place so that it holds those ends and the ends are nice and tucked in so you can't see them from the inside or the outside. Okay, now turn your basket a quarter turn from where you ended so you'll do the start of the next row in between the start of your last two rows. And now we'll start to turn a quarter turn every time we add a new row. So clamp this here. To leave. Overlap that end. I'm going to hold it in place with my fingers this time. 
come to the outside edge of that fourth stake over, trim down and tuck this behind, and then we'll place our clamp, hold it in place, rotate a quarter turn, and start a new row. And as you go, you want to press your rows tightly together, pack them together so that you don't end up with any spaces. As the reed dries, it begins to shrink. And if you don't pack, you'll end up with large spaces in between your rows and a loose basket, which ends up not looking super great when you're finished. So I like to pack things pretty tightly when it's damp so that I have a nice full tight basket when I'm done weaving. Okay, I'm going to overlap these ends, turn this down, tuck it in, replace that clamp. Now I'm going to grab a new piece of reed and continue weaving the walls to the height that I want it to end up. So for me, I think that was nine inches tall is what I'm shooting for. And the shape of the basket at this point is up to how much tension or how loose you weave your rows, not in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical direction. So horizontal, no, not in the vertical direction, but in the horizontal direction. So if you want all your rows nice and packed down, so you're pulling your rows down like this as you're working to make sure that they're nice and packed and close as close to the base as they can get so that you're putting as many rows in between the base and where you put the rim as you can. And then to change the shape of the basket or the walls of the basket, you can either add some looseness to the base and start to create a nice rounded shape and then pull in as you near the top. Or if you want more of a vase shape, you can loosen your rows so that it starts to bow out more like a glass or a cup or a vase. So you can play around with different tensions. You can even, if you want to get really fun with it, you can start to pull in tight and then loosen up and create kind of a um, sculptured shape where it curves in a bit. Uh, yeah, so play around with tension and the packing and all of that to get the size of basket that you want. I'll share some music with you and see you when the walls of this basket are completed. Okay, here is the walls of my basket all woven. You can see I did the quarter inch flat oval reed to start out and then I decided I wanted to throw in some half inch flat reed. So I did those rows here, some seagrass, and then up here back to the quarter inch flat reed, flat oval reed. And now it's time to do the cut and tuck. So finishing off these stakes so that they're tucked into the basket and they'll hold the basket together. Now you can see I did a certain pattern on my basket. You can play around with the pattern that you do on your basket, either adding different types of reed or just sticking with the one type, incorporating seagrass or not. There's lots of different things you can do depending on what size of reed you have, what type of reed, if you have seagrass, that kind of thing. I went with more of a vase, well, not vase, more of a bowl style basket. I didn't want it to curve in like the bean pot does. Uh, at the top, I wanted to have somewhat straight walls that kind of have a bowl so that I could fit a nice deep pot in there for, um, or plant in here. So now for cut and tuck, what you're going to do is be very careful which ones you go around and do this on because cutting and tucking technique, you need to cut the right ones and tuck the right ones in order for the basket to 
to stay together. So the stakes that are on the outside or that last row where the stake is over top of that last row, these are going to be our tuck rows. We're going to fold them over that top row of weaving and create a crease. And if your stakes are dry at this point, dampen them. Again, you can roll it around in the water bin to get them wet or spray it down with your water bottle, squirt bottle. Uh, you're going to fold over all of the stakes that are around or over top of that last weaver. And what this will do is we'll be looping. So here is that last weaver. We'll be looping the stake up and over top and cinching it down. That will hold all of the layers of the basket down. And I just remembered before I do that, I like to go through and tuck everything or pack everything down nice and tight. Make sure all my rows are nice and tight. You can use a straight tip packer to do this or use your fingers. Mine is moving pretty well just with my hands. So I'm going to do this all the way around, maybe once or twice to make sure it's all packed. I've been packing as I go, so it's pretty well where I want it to be. So then go around, fold over all of these stakes around that top row. And then all of the stakes that are behind that last weaver, these stakes here, you're going to cut flush with that top row of weaving. Cut all the way around. Don't cut any of the folded ones, just the ones that are behind. And then you can get rid of your scraps. I like to save some of these scraps for um, dye samples. If I'm going to dye my reed, I can use these as testers to make sure it dyes the color I want. You can also compost these or throw them in the trash if you want. At this point in the video, my overhead camera had blipped out. So check out the video in the upper right hand corner or in the description below. I'll give you the timestamp of another video that I did where I explain cut and tuck and give you a tutorial on how to do that. And then once you've tucked all those in, you can go to the outside of the basket and tuck the edges so that they're hidden behind the stake on the outside. Now we're going to set up the rim. I have a piece of half inch flat, whoa, I have a piece of half inch flat oval reed here. I'm going to curl this up, stick it in my water bin and allow it to soak for a few minutes. You might have to hold it in if it's really wily, get it damp, and then you can pull it out. And now we're going to measure it around the outside of the basket. So it's going to live on the top, over top of that last weaver. So, so uh, hold it in place. You can use one of your black plastic clamps to hold it in place on the outside and feed it around the outside of the basket. And I'm doing this first off because I want to measure the length, cut it to length, and then, uh, and then I'll trim down the ends. So I'm going to overlap about two inches, trim that down, then unclamp it, and grab a box knife or a carving knife, something sharp that you can trim this end down. And you're going to take the rounded side and we're going to trim it down to the width of a flat reed so that we can overlap the ends and we don't create a large lump with two pieces of flat oval on top of each other. So we can pull it together. You can see I've trimmed it down quite a bit. They'll overlap like this and the bulk is whittled down significantly. And I just launched that across the room. So I'm gonna go get it now. Now we'll put this on the basket and then we'll trim down the other piece and do the outer or the inner rim. So I'm going to line this up with that top weaver. So we're just overlapping this row right here, like so, and then clamp about every six inches or so around the top of the basket, or as often as you feel you need to, to hold it in place. It might want to fling out depending on how stiff the reed is. So I'm adding a clamp and then rotating around and holding the reed as tight up against the wall of the basket as I can. Do one more clamp here. Doing a few more clamps in every six inches just to make sure things hold in place. Now I have a bit longer length than I need, so I'm going to trim this down to the point where I 
whittled this under piece down. So trim this down to length and then overlap these ends like that. Clamp that in place and there is your outer rim. Now let's trim down the end of this piece of flat oval reed the same way we did that first piece down to a flat reed thickness. rid of all the scraps. Okay, and then we're going to train this to curl or curve in the opposite direction that it wants to because we want the rounded side of this reed to be facing the inside of the basket. So train that to curve and then place the whittled end on the opposite side of where you overlapped the outer rim. So I overlapped here. I'm going to Put this onto the inside of the basket over here. Clamp those layers together and then we'll feed it into the basket, lifting up the clamps and clamping the two rims and the basket between them. Make sure you hold these ends together so that they don't splay out as you incorporate the new rim in the clamp. You might need to make some adjustments if things loosen up or shift around. And then I'll trim this length to the right length and then overlap those and clamp that in place. So that's my inner rim. Now you can either use a large round reed to fill the gap between the two rims or I'm going to use seagrass to fill this gap. You can also leave it empty if you would rather. You will see into the basket when we finish lashing and you will be able to see the raw edges of the cut and tuck uh, pieces. So I like to cover it up just because it makes a nice clean finish. But whatever you want to do, whatever style you're going for. You could also play around with other types of filler like yarn or string, um, twigs. <laughs> play around with different ideas. So I'm feeding this seagrass in between those two pieces of the rim so that they fill that gap. It looks like this rim is a little bit bigger than my space so I need to feed it over so that the ends overlap more. And lifting every clamp so that I can tuck the seagrass underneath it. And then I'll cut a little bit extra length just in case for some reason as I'm twining or lashing the seagrass shifts and I don't have enough. It's easier to cut off excess than it is to add what's not there. And I'm going to do a basic lashing on this rim. So if you want to see how to do a basic lashing on your basket, check out this video up here. I go through a tutorial on how to do that. And here's your finished planter. If you have little bits of hairs coming off of your reed, you can go around and trim those off. You could also try sanding them, but I found that that typically just roughs up the basket even more. So I like to go around and trim off any of the more noticeable ones. Then I suggest staining and sealing or sealing your basket. So staining them a different color and then sealing that or just sealing it to the natural color, and this will protect it from mold and mildew. I highly suggest doing that, especially if you live somewhere humid, because the reed does start to mildew. If you don't want to put a sealer on it, just know that you can wash these with soap and water, wash your baskets with soap and water, uh, just scrub them off if they get any uh, mildew or mold on them. However, I think that the bacteria or mildew mold, once it, uh, starts in the material it just comes back as soon as it gets damp again so or moist uh yeah so check out this video all about stains and sealers and how to finish your basket i i highly suggest signing the bottom of your basket with your name and the date and maybe where you wove it just as a reminder it's a great legacy piece i like looking back on baskets that i wove many years ago and being able to see the dates that i wove them and where i wove them or who i wove them for Allow your basket to dry for up to 24 hours before you stain or seal it or seal it because 
Uh, the reed, especially the rim, is thick and you want it to be completely dry before sealing in any moisture. You want no moisture, no moisture in your baskets. Yeah, and then once you do that, it's time to use it for your plants or whatever it is you want to use it for. So I'm going to pull out this guy and see how this fits. How does this work? How do you work? Thing, thing, thing. So there is my hanging basket. I've got some problems with this rope. I think it bundled up too long. There's my hanging basket. Check the description below for links to the tools and materials I used in this project and a link to my Patreon. Patreon is a way for creators to be supported by their audience through small monthly donations in exchange for exclusive content. If you want to check out my Patreon, the link's in the description below as well. And I have several online video courses for basket weaving, some more step-by-step -step tutorials on how to weave a number of different baskets and how to learn how to create your own custom basket designs as well. So check those out in the description or on my website, textileindie.com. Thanks so much for watching. Like this video if you want more basket weaving videos. If you're new here, subscribe and hit the bell to get notified whenever I put out a new video. Thanks so much for visiting and I hope to see you again. And I will see you all in the next video. See you later and happy basket weaving. Bye.